are we calling too many things trauma? Mm. What are some of the bright lines that any parent should do to protect their child from abuse? And then that person's living in the feeling of being constantly a source of disappointment. Yes. And that's probably excruciating. We should not expect them to be perfectly able to be as chaste as somebody who did not have that experience. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today I'm going to be sitting down with Michael Gasparo, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We are exploring the question of abuse and how to protect your children from abuse, particularly sexual abuse, how to navigate sticky situations with people that you love in your life who are struggling because of abusive histories or maybe something that happened in your past and how to overcome and how to ultimately discover healing and true freedom. Michael has been on the show before. You might remember him from our incredibly interesting deep dive into the question of same-sex attraction. I think you're going to enjoy this episode as well. As always, do not forget to subscribe to the show if you're not already subscribed, whether you're on YouTube or podcast app, and don't forget to rate the show and give us five stars. That helps the show reach more people. Thanks for coming back on the show, Michael. Yeah, thank you for having me. Great to see you again. Thank you. You, you did awesome last time. Thank you. It people, was a good time. It was fun. People loved loved the episode with you, and it was really a lot, tons of great feedback. And we're going to talk about some of the, I guess, the positive fallout from the episode because a lot of people uh, had a lot of comments and questions that mm. I think deserve us to do another dive into. Sure. Dive into it, but um, but yeah, for people that didn't see that episode yet quick background on Michael Gasparo. Well, I shared about how I have had experiences in my own life with same-sex attraction, mm -hmm. and that as a result of that and my Catholic faith together, I found myself trying to find a way to integrate my sexual struggles with my faith according to my conscience. And that has been a lifelong journey, and partly through psychological help mm -hmm. and interventions, but also through spiritual healing, God has brought me to where I am, which is more free and healed than I was before. And it's just a journey now until eternity to just keep opening my heart to that love that has brought me here. Beautiful. Okay, so let's start with this comment that I saw that is really what a lot of our conversation is going to be about, but we'll see where it goes. Okay. Um, sexual trauma and unpacking that because a lot of people, I think there's some statistics that say like one in every five children experience mm. some kind of sexual trauma or one in every three women are the victims of rape. I mean, some of these statistics might be uh, exaggerated, but certainly this is something that's happening a lot and mm -hmm. a lot of people are impacted by it. Um, growing up, I had a girlfriend, uh, one of my closest friends experienced sexual abuse. So I think everyone has a story like that, whether it's themselves or someone that they mm -hmm. know they love. And so what does that mean as people get older, the impact of that lifelong on mm -hmm. them? There's a lot of different impacts. But I want to read this comment that I saw um, on the episode that we did that I thought was just really powerful. And I want to hear your, your thoughts on this. So this is someone saying, a lot of children have had trauma due to exposure to things children should have never been exposed to. I was bisexual in my 20s and not until therapy that specialized in sexual trauma did I understand that this attraction was me trying to be closer to my mother who alienated me and the fact that my abuse from three years old to 16 years old crazy by the same family member went ignored i did not want any men near me because i felt as though all men wanted to do was put things inside of me as a child i mean really ho horrific i see this in the feminist movement so much because of the fear of men is in reality is it is a real reality for a lot of women who have been abused as little girls and as adults at parties being drunk and then she goes on to share about how she felt that you know, sexual promiscuity was like a quick fix for her instead of learning to understand herself and learning what true love mm. was. Wow. Very heavy, but powerful that she's sharing this and talking about how that, you know, hearing you share your story and some of your work, you know, prompted her to want to share this and talk about her path to healing. Yeah. And that kind of story is not as uncommon as we would like it to be. I have a lot of clients who were abused sexually from a young age by family members, um, family friends, and it is especially even hard to f find out how to deal with that when you're experiencing it by a loved one, mm -hmm. because it's more confusing. Mm -hmm. It And it's especially confusing when, and this is the part that is hard for people to hear, so I want to speak delicately about this, but 
when children are touched inappropriately like that poor young woman, there's this double wound. There's a psychological wound and fear and shame around the thing that happened, but then around sexuality in general, which makes it harder to become integrated as an adult and effectively mature as an adult. And the last thing I would say is there's the, that other side of the wound, the spiritual wound, the moral wound um, of being violated in a way that is both deeply psychologically and spiritually harmful. Well, let's start with the the, the adult who experiences as a kid, right? Mm. So what do you think are the worst things that someone can do with that in their history as a way to deal with it? And then what would you recommend as the solutions? Like if someone experienced mm. sexual abuse or some sort of sexual trauma, um, before we go to that, actually, let's just define what is sexual abuse and sexual trauma? Can we define that first? Yes. So sexual abuse could lead to trauma. So mm. we'll, we'll first focus on what is abuse. And I would say there's a, a gray line here with people of the same age that are children, because it can be very harmful. I think we see a lot of people trying to normalize sexual play among kids. I, have you heard that talked about like amongst kind of progressive movements, like, oh, that's normal and healthy for children to be touching each other. And that's not true. I think it's really important that we make it clear that even if it was kind of unintentional because a child is exploring, that it's not helpful that they're doing that because it can arouse emotions within their bodies that they're not yet ready to intellectually comprehend or spiritually make sense of. Or I've seen like Planned Parenthood as an example, you know, that some of these, you know, pro, unfortunately, horribly abortion, but also pro sexual sexuality groups in terms of let children experiment sexually. Mm -hmm. So there's this recommended sexual education about like, you know, self pleasure, like, you know, it's good for kids to self pleasure, or at least adolescents, it's good to, I mean, ultimately masturbate. I mean, that is, unfortunately, some of the prevailing sexual education, mm. sexual education that some of these progressive groups promote. Yeah, including in schools. Right. And that's my concern as well. And that's why I'm saying that even if you don't define it as uh, legal abuse, because it's not done by an adult to a child, or it's not, it doesn't have to be an adult. It actually be an older child to a younger child. Even if it's the same age children, those two factors to consider. One, that even if it's just innocent childhood experimentation that they don't understand, it can still be harmful. So we want to protect them by helping educate children that, you know, the things we talked about last time about particular boundaries to keep in mind for young children. But two, sometimes children will do things to other children that had they had done to them. And that's what we talked about last time is often called trauma reenactment. Mm -hmm. So that's why even if it's among same age children, especially before the age of reason, but even afterward in childhood, it's not beneficial, necessary, it's even harmful and unhelpful for children to be enacting sexual play of any kind. So that would be a type of abuse that is less intentional because it would be same age children. Then let's define abuse from an older child or even an adult. It's essentially using a child in any way to arouse sexual pleasure for the adult's sake. That is abusive in, in essence, even if the child doesn't perceive it as abuse. But could something be sexually abusive even if it's not intended to, or like it's not like a, a sexual thing for the adult, but it's still involved, you know, body parts that involve like the genitals that involve sex and there's some kind of like punishment or there's some sort of, you know, being degrading of that child. Because I think, I mean, I was reading a, a story recently of a young woman who talked about how she was, the way she was uh, disciplined by her mm. parents involved like spanking on the bare bottom. And that had the effect for her that had trauma associated with sex for her because mm. they're, you know, treating that part of her body in this ultimately disrespectful way. I think that makes sense. Yeah. So there are nuances to how uh, types of harmful parenting, harmful disciplinary styles that are ab abusive, even if they're not directly sexual, can result in sexual wounds in adulthood. But sexual abuse specifically is more tar is as defined by more a targeting of a child for sexual pleasure for the mm -hmm. adult's sake. And the kind of reason I'm offering that definition with a little bit more a broad scope is because if an if a adult doesn't even touch a child, but they get give a lascivious look and they're kind of lusting in their, in, in their evil heart towards that child and a child perceives that, that's abusive, even if there was never any physical contact. Mm -hmm. So we have to broaden it a bit beyond just physical touching or physical stimulation to what is an adult's intention in their heart 
towards a child and then, of course, any subsequent actions? And is it a pure intention of love towards a child for the child's own sake, or is it to arouse some sexual pleasure within themselves at the expense of a child's innocence? What are some of the bright lines that you think any parent should do to protect their child from abuse? Exodus 90 has changed the lives of thousands of men, making them more spiritually, physically, and mentally strong, and more successful in their relationships, work, and life. Ladies, this is an amazing program to share with the men that you love. And men, if you haven't tried it already, now is the time. Exodus 90 was created by men for men and offers men a path to greater freedom by helping them temporarily detach from unhealthy habits and teaching them physical, mental, and spiritual toughness. This 90-day journey, supported by the Exodus 90 app and community, connects men with accountability partners and provides daily inspiration to strengthen their resolve and encourage them down a path of self-discipline. The results speak for themselves. 99% of men who make an exodus report a greater level of freedom than they've ever experienced before. For the men in our audience, I encourage you to join Exodus 90 with Monsignor James Che, the president of the University of Mary, who is a spiritual guide for Advent this year on the Exodus 90 app. Go to exodus90.com slash Lila to learn more about Advent on the Exodus 90 app. That's exodus90.com slash Lila to join men from around the world this Advent starting December 1st. We talked a little bit about this last time, so I would also reiterate forming deep, affirming, loving relationship with your children and fostering a sense that there is nothing a child can't talk to you about is probably a default best protection because we can't control everything that happens to our children. I don't have children right now, but I know parents cannot control everything that happens to their children, but you can help your child know their inherent dignity and worth and value a, which gives a child a sense of confidence that they know that they deserve to be treated with dignity, but B, if they are violated in any way, they will trust that you are the one they go to. And your reaction to anything bad that happens to your child, in line with what this person's saying on the comment, is almost more important in some ways as a parent than what happens outside of your control to your child. Because that commenter said that their abuse was ignored, mm -hmm. right? So that implies that it wasn't just the abuse that was harmful, it was the lack of response of an attentive parent um, that was also subsequently harmful, and maybe to an even greater degree. So for someone who is an adult, what would be the top things that they could do to heal from past sexual abuse? Wow, man. Yeah. I think the first step That's is- a huge question. I know, right? <laughs> the, uh, what comes to my mind is acknowledging your need for healing. Mm. I know that might sound obvious, but I was at this mass at uh, Good Shepherd in Beverly Hills, and there's this priest there named Father Colm. He's 95. Lila, he is amazing. He is just an incredible, gentle man. And he talked about in seeking healing in the Bible, the leper first had to acknowledge that he had leprosy to even mm. desire healing from Jesus. And so we have to take an honest look at ourselves and say, what happened to me? What's fueling behaviors in my life or feelings or distress in my life that I might need healing from? So just starting with asking Jesus to help reveal our wounds to ourselves, reveal me to me, Lord. Um, because we don't, what's kind of cool as Christians, we don't have to like get to know ourselves by ourselves. Mm. God wants to help reveal us to us. And in that knowledge of awareness of a wound, then step two or B, I forget if I started with numbers or letters, but the next step would be go outside of yourself to seek healing as well. Because while we can bring healing into our own lives by our receptivity to God and others, that takes a real courageous next step to say, who can I talk to? Who's a trusted person in my life that I can talk to? Is it my priest? Is it my spouse? Is it a dear friend? Um, and that next step opens a lot of other possibilities from there. Why, why is it so important to talk to someone about it? And I think this is especially real for men, but certainly it affects a lot of women too. But I think there is some people, they don't have an issue sharing about tough things that have happened to them with other people. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe they're an oversharer and they just are very open and they'll share with anyone. Right. Okay. And, and then there's other people that maybe they're more selective or they're, it's, it's more, they hold their cards closer to their chest. Mm -hmm. They don't just like share. And then there's other people that really don't share. Like they don't even share with their closest friend. If they have a closest friend, mm -hmm. like really tough things that have happened to them. Right. So there's all these like categories of the different amount of sharing that people do. Right. Yeah. Um, and then you can say some of it's generational, like, you know, 
boomers don't share because they're like, you know, or maybe I guess it would be the golden generation, like they were really tough and they just didn't share tough things that happened to them, right? Have you heard of these generational mm -hmm. differences? Yeah. And like Gen Z will just share everything. And it also depends on your age, whatever. But what I'm trying to get to here is why is it so important to talk to somebody about bad things that happened to you? Is it necessary yeah. to do that? I, I think so. I mean, we have to start with something and someone. I think some people can turn to God first because that's the mm -hmm. easiest thing, but some people have a hard time turning to God because they project their uh, negative internalized view of themselves onto God. So mm -hmm. God is a scary person. So that you can be God to somebody, meaning that you are the face and hands of Jesus to somebody. So they might turn to you before they even turn to God. So as Christians, this is where we have a responsibility to be the heart of Christ for others uh, and to dialogue from heart to heart with them. Uh, St. John Henry Newman, I mentioned him last time, mm -hmm. his motto was cor ad cor loquitur, I think, mm -hmm. heart to heart and dialogue with Christ. I love that. Yeah. It's and, beautiful. And that idea that one heart dialoguing mm -hmm. with another is a deeper reflection of the Christian mm -hmm. life than just intellectual propositions. So what, what I'm talking about when we reveal ourselves to another, it's not just words we're saying about something that happened. It's saying, here's my heart. Here's what happened to me. And being seen in that experience of revealing our heart to another heart, there's something inherently very healing about it when we're received in that in a tender way. Is there a psychological backing for that? I mean, it makes sense from a common sense perspective and yeah. like a so, sort of a spiritual perspective, but... What would be the psychological underpinning? Like, I guess that's like talk therapy, right? Yeah. Just by talking about your unburdening yourself mm -hmm. to someone, you can do better. Yes. So there, I think you're right. Like there's an unburdening that happens by sharing that burden mm -hmm. with another. Um, and in externalizing our experiences, we begin to be able to reprocess them in a way that helps us establish new narratives around it. Mm -hmm. Part of what trauma therapists say reinforces the mm -hmm. Um, extenuation of, of trauma symptoms or the like continuation of trauma symptoms is the narratives we hold on to about what happened to us, mm. not just the thing itself. And that's kind of a whole other topic. But in saying out loud the narratives I have about myself and sharing from the heart another's experience um, or, you know, sharing heart to heart with mm. another that experience, I can start to see both through their reflection back to me, but also through cognitive flexibility, new narratives Maybe it's not, I'm bad. Maybe it's something bad happened to me. You know, that's a huge shift. That can be life-changing for somebody to be able to just shift a small way how we hold mm -hmm. the truth about ourselves related to what happened to us. So uh, back to kind of this idea of sharing with somebody else, because I I, I think... Have you have you seen Abigail Schreier's book, Bad Therapy? Have you heard of that book? I've heard of the book. Yeah, I have not read it yet, but so, I'm familiar with the, the theories. So her it. whole theory, I've I was listening to it on tape. It's kind of been I've tried. I have like ten books I'm reading at any given like week at the same time or listening to. But, anyways, her whole thing, as I as I know you know, is that there's too much therapy. We've sort of um, patholog patholo patholog pathologized. Thank you. We've pathologized everything. And like little kids are, you know, boys who are just restless in class because they're not really supposed to be sitting in a classroom seven or eight hours a day. Mm. Diagnosed with ADHD, they start to get into the system of like mental, the larger mental health care ecosystem. Everyone's medicated now. So there's her theory, and I'm not doing it full justice in how I'm describing it, but this is part of her theory, right? We had Catherine Packalick on the show recently, and she was talking about how um, in her surveying of women who've had really big families, she discovered that there were all of these, uh, and she's a PhD economist who writes about like the birth dearth, the decline in mm -hmm. birth um, rates, and then how there's these families having a lot of kids. Anyways, she found that families that had a lot of kids reported better ability, ability resilience for the older kids to deal with tough stuff because there were younger kids in the house. Mm. Meaning babies actually, well, there's stressors associated with the baby. They also bring this positive experience to those around them, new meaning, new life, getting yourself outside of yourself. Mm -hmm. And they actually helped mental health outcomes for the family, oh, Wow! which is sort of what is against the common knowledge today. The common knowledge today is that babies are stressful and tough and you shouldn't have them if you're in a tough spot. And her research is showing actually babies help us uh, in this incredible way, like rise above and like get outside of ourselves. Anyways, I'm, where I'm going with all of this is, are we calling too many things trauma mm. and needing this sort of psychological solution via therapy 
uh, too much? Is that part of our problem today? Or is it just that we need more intimate friends and family relationships that get us outside of ourselves and are safe places Mm -hmm. for us to share Mm -hmm. our burdens? Did you know that every year, 200,000 families go bankrupt from medical bills, even with health insurance. For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your healthcare. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident, to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, crowd health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to join crowd health today. Use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. I think it could be both um, in the sense that there are real times where a person trained to understand the particular aspects of sexual abuse that may impact somebody's development and even be influencing their current behaviors can be a really helpful tool, especially if that person is sensitive to the body soul unity of the human person and respectful of the need for spiritual and psychological healing and does not see therapy as an ends in itself, but as a means towards continuing to bring God's healing into your life. Um, particularly because then they can, a therapist may be able to foster you to also building and support resources outside of therapy. Uh, but I think that in terms of talking, having a therapeutic effect, talking with a dear friend and revealing your wound to a loved one is therapeutic, whether or not you want to call it professional therapy. Uh, and so in that sense, I agree with you. We we don't need to worry about over-pathologizing sexual trauma because that, in particular mm-hmm. to our topic today, if anything, we need to be more clear about how much can be traumatic in that field. So for instance, broadening our definition to counter, like you said, Planned Parenthood's ridiculous sexual education model, exposure to pornography is traumatic for children. And so that's another example where we should be cautious to not let the culture minimize how much we call trauma. But in general, yes, do we maybe pathologize the wrong things at times, but that is if we have a bad idea of the human person. Mm. So if we have an anchored view of the human person in Christian anthropology as made in God's image and likeness with inherent dignity, male or female, beloved by God, infinitely loved, and basically a helpless child before God, we get that right, that we need God, he created us, and we are called to love him in return and love our neighbor as ourself. We won't call the wrong things trauma, I think, in that case. So you're, what you're saying, and I agree with this, it's like our culture doesn't take sexual trauma seriously enough. Right. Because everything's so sexualized, including children in so many mm-hmm. ways. And so that's not serious, taken seriously enough. Maybe there's other kind of aspects of human behavior that are over pathologized, mm-hmm. but we're not, when it comes to sexual trauma, that's not that's not it. Right. And I, and to be fair to Abigail Schreier, she's not talking about sexual right. trauma in her book. She's more talking about behavioral stuff right. uh, that ends up having big uh, impacts on kids. Although, you know, maybe some of it's rooted in sexual trauma that's not diagnosed. Who knows, right? right. How, what are the statistics on sexual trauma? Do we know? I know I said at the beginning some statistics, but um, I don't know if those are correct. I think it is varied between studies and how they define what sexual trauma is. I think it's reasonable. Let's just talk about reasonable assumptions. Think about anecdotally the people in your life who you know in your circles. How common is exposure to pornography at an early age? And I have seen studies quoted the average age of exposure for most children is 8 to 11 years old. I can't say that that's true for everybody, and I think we could all just— And would you say that's all a trauma? Sorry to interrupt, but is every time you— exposure to— Oh, you— Can it be a trauma? To be exposed to pornography. Yeah. I think it's almost always going to be traumatic if they're especially mm-hmm. that age range, 8 to 11 years old, and they have not been educated on love and life from their parents, and then they're exposed to graphic sexual images. That's confusing, and it's scary, and it might also be exciting because children are naturally inclined to be aroused like adults are. We are aroused by beauty and images of good, but they're perverse. 
-hmm. images because they're exploiting individuals and so that are in those images. And so it's it's the reason it's traumatic again is because it cannot be properly integrated because there is inherently going to be shame and fear because mm -hmm. they're not cognitively prepared for a that level of intense input sensory input and b it's not good for anyone to have that kind of input because it's not the way we're meant to be kind of uh, consuming that kind of material <laughs> you know that's not intended for human flourishing that we'd be watching those kinds of images so for those that have you know we're kind of talking about the adult who is a survivor of some sort of sexual trauma and your point here which is a powerful one is like uh, maybe it's almost all adults to some degree, you know, because if it is, if it is pornography has this impact of having, being able to traumatize or harm. And it's most people have been exposed to pornography, especially men, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's most boys have been exposed to pornography. I think I remember seeing a statistic that was like over 90%. Mm -hmm. So everyone has had that, you could say trauma. And then of course there's addiction that enters into the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think trauma when we are experiencing something that is negative, the degree to which we react, we in the psychology world, you might use a frame of reference called like an acute stressor. Mm -hmm. And if you're exposed to an acute stressor, it's like, you know, at any age, you're going to have stress responses in the body. Mm -hmm. And if those ex responses are extreme and are prolonged, they become forms of post-traumatic stress. And if they're long enough and severe enough, we call post-traumatic stress disorder. So often with sexual abuse, there will be PTSD. That's not uncommon. Um, to the degree that somebody has a diagnosable trauma-based disorder, mm -hmm. there's a whole variety of factors that would influence that, including someone's biology, temperament, personality, age of exposure, length of the trauma, was it repeated, was it processed mm -hmm. soon after with their family, was there spiritual and physical and psychological healing that they were integrated, uh, that was given to them early on. So there's all these factors that would effect how does that traumatic experience impact subsequent trauma stressors and trauma responses. Um, but, you know, so we shouldn't you just say uniformly, anyone that's exposed to a pornographic image at a young age is going to have mm -hmm. this set of symptoms. But we can say it's objectively a negative thing that will have a bad impact and needs to be mitigated through parental and psychological and spiritual healing. So yeah, so this is kind of back to our definition of trauma, right? And what you're saying is it, it, just because something is a trauma or has the potential to be a trauma doesn't mean that that person is traumatized. Yeah, especially so to, to the degree, like it's yeah. going to differ per person right. based on what happened to them. So for people that are dealing with, you know, some sort of early childhood or childhood sexual exposure, mm -hmm. or so there's exposure, there's sexual abuse, the exposure can have the impact of abuse. Um, back to kind of adulthood, you were kind of walking us down a road of things that someone could do in unearthing that. You mm. talked about uh, making sure that they talk to someone about it and that can open the door to healing. What are some other core steps that you recommend for healing from sexual trauma or sexual mm -hmm. exposure? Man, I, I think it's before I even give an answer specifically, I think we need to start with injecting hope here mm -hmm. because... God loves us so much, and he is for us more than we are for ourselves. And I've spent a lot of my adult life asking God to help me see that, um, that he is more for me than I am for myself. And what's so harmful about sexual trauma is that it happens within our own body. And so then it's sort of like this confusing double double wound. There's the spiritual and psychological wound that I mentioned earlier, but then there's also the mental gymnastics we have to go through to like make sense of, am I lovable before God because of feeling so often sullied by this experience, if that even is fully conscious. Sometimes that belief is sort of pre-conscious, not fully conscious, so it expresses itself in the way we seek affirmation and healing in all the wrong places. For instance, you know, don't seek affirmation in bed, as uh, you know, is probably aptly stated by uh, especially Dr. Conrad Bars, who writes a lot about feeling and healing your emotions after things like this and in general. So I think hope, I don't know why it's on my heart, Lila, but like before we even talk about anything else, it's our hope is in God and nothing we do or had done to us can take away that inherent dignity that is in 
imbued uh, by our creator on our very self. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I can't think, I don't think that can be overstated, especially it's such a heavy topic and we just like kind of went right into it. Yeah. 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 And it's so, it's also hopeful that God is the God of all healing and that even in this life, we may not experience perfect healing. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important. What's so cool about being Christians is that we can speak about traumas with an eternal perspective. Mm -hmm. And in the Bible, it says, we do not grieve as those who have no hope. And our hope is in something bigger than this life only. So with the comments you read, mm -hmm. people might be like, well, how am I, what hope is there for me if I've lived through 20 years of abuse? Mm -hmm. Well, one, God wants us to bring earth, uh, kingdom of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. So we do want to bring wherever we can God's healing, love, and light through psychological and spiritual intervention and support. But whatever wounds remain in this life will be healed perfectly in the next with the Lord if we go to be with God for all eternity. And I can't think of anything more hopeful than that. So I just think we have to keep that in focus as Christians that we grieve, we do grieve. So abuse is a, a trauma that needs to be grieved, but we have to remember that we are allowed to help people grieve with hope. And he is the father of all consolations. And those of us who have been consoled by his mercy through Jesus Christ are called to share that consolation with others. What is the, um, like if you have someone come to you and I know you've had this in your practice, but mm -hmm. they have, they're trying to heal from sexual trauma. You know, we talked about talking to someone about it as a first step. Yep. What is sort of the typical response for healing? You know, you mentioned knowing God's love for you and having hope that healing mm -hmm. is possible. Uh, certainly I'm sure there can be like spiritual healings that can be given without even like maybe therapy or other yeah. things. God does what he wants to do. God does what he wants to do. But are there some sort of like, like must haves that you would say in the toolbox for healing? Or would it be more like, it just depends on the person and their needs and having a good Christian therapist is going to be a big part of navigating that. Mm. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one. And everylife.com is a pro-life company. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join, join the Changing Lives Club, use the code LILA at checkout, Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. I think it's often both and in this conversation. So the thing that comes to my mind is as a therapist trained to help people with these issues and have lived, having lived through some similar experiences to what we're talking about today, I found healing in my own life through therapy, through psychological interventions. We mentioned eye movement desensitization mm -hmm. and reprocessing. It's an evidence-based trauma treatment, mm -hmm. and it uses both cognitive therapy, meaning changing our schematics, our, our thoughts and our stories to help impact our emotions and our behaviors, but it uses also behavioral therapy, which means an exposure. We remember the thing that happened. It exposes us to that thing. So it uses cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, and this cool thing called bilateral stimulation of the brain through eye movement or through tapping or through sounds. Is that the kind of like hip, almost, it feels hypnotic, but it's not yeah, it can. They sometimes they use uh, eye movements mm -hmm. that you right to left, but it's all client directed, self led. Mm -hmm. It's not actual hypnosis. Mm -hmm. The client always remains full in control of their faculties, but it's meant to and intended to keep right hemisphere and left hemisphere both online and engaged while reflecting cognitively on what happened to you and exposing yourself behaviorally to the memory. And that helps shape the narrative differently. And they believe it even supports through this bilateral stimulation of the brain. It somehow speeds the process up of helping the brain relegate that trauma memory to long-term memory storage. So that post-traumatic stress, which is where the memory feels like it's still currently happening, it's sort of fresh in the front of our minds, now it's that that thing that happened to me, not the thing that is still happening. It helps shut down the amygdala response, which is the, our lizard brain, the fight or flight reaction in the brain, and keep more online the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that has higher uh, cognitive reasoning faculties.
Do you want me to expand on that at all? Or yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Well, so when when someone comes to therapy, that's one example mm -hmm. of in the psychological world, a common evidence-based trauma reprocessing technique that is a psychological intervention using the brain's natural healing capacities, but it's done in the presence ideally of a loving other who sees you. Now you've revealed heart to heart what's happening, but also we're employing these natural faculties that the brain can do to help heal itself. So there is an interpersonal component, an intrapersonal component within myself, the brain healing itself, and on top of that, if it's a Christian therapist, there can be a spiritual component. So you can pray with a client. I know there are therapists in a group that I'm a part of called the Catholic Psychotherapy Association who integrate inner prayer healing ministry with EMDR because they want to bring all of us to the ultimate source of healing, which is God. God is the source of all healing, whether it's through a psychological intervention or otherwise. And there's so many beautiful ways that that can happen too, with people bringing these wounds even to ministries. You know, with in the pro-life movement, there is all kinds of support needed for psychological help for women who are post-abortive, mm -hmm. but there's also ministerial approaches. Like, I think it's uh, Rachel's, Rachel's, Vineyard. Rachel's Vineyard, where they're actively seeking healing in the spiritual context that's not strictly a psychological exercise, but it, it's always both and. How much do you think of healing us up this, along with EMDR and, and those sorts of therapies would are, the, you mentioned it earlier, like this, the importance of changing the narrative about what happened to you, like the mindset of what happened yeah. to you? Because I think so much, I know like Jordan Peterson, a lot of his work is around this, like telling the story of one's life and having a story arc for your own life. Because if you, if you, if your story is set in stone that you are a certain way, mm -hmm. certain behaviors you're fated to, your childhood was a certain way. And because of it, you are sort of limited in a certain way. Mm -hmm. You're sort of have certain obstacles that you will always have. You're going to never be able to, you know, achieve certain things that can change the trajectory of someone's life dramatically. Yeah. And they might have had a different life if they had simply had a different thought process about what was possible for them. Yeah. Or about what had happened to them. I think th it's really interesting you mentioned that being a what then what helps somebody be able to change that narrative because may maybe most people want to but they have a hard time and so one uh aspect of this idea of healing interpersonally is we need other people to help us see ourselves differently and that's where mm -hmm. both yes emdr and these trauma reprocessing methods that can help people shift the narrative about themselves are good and helpful and you being with me heart to heart may help me see myself differently and capable of a different trajectory. So I think interpersonal aspects of healing journeys are essential for helping us shake ourselves out of, like sometimes we don't even know what those narratives are. We're not even fully we don't aware. Even know we're living under a certain narrative. Yes, until somebody else can help see like you're more than that. Mm -hmm. And they can, and this is what we call a, a, corrective emotional experience. It's more than just knowing it. And I see this a lot with people with SSA in my practice, but also with people with sexual abuse. You, they, Some of them are experts on theology of the body. They know their body's a good thing. They have the cognitive awareness that sexuality is a gift, but they lack sensory knowledge, emotional knowledge that it is, because whenever they feel an arousal, they feel shame and fear. And so how do we help people? Yeah, you can change their intellect you can say hey just listen to this story god made you good and sexuality is a beautiful thing and it's a gift from god but they need an experience that shows them at the sense level which aquinas i believe says and is cognitive cognitive ideas include both sensory knowledge and intellectual knowledge it's called con natural experience we learn like with the children, if you have a child and you tell them the stove is hot, they like believe you that the stove's hot, but they don't really know that the stove's hot until unfortunately they touch the stove and then it's hot and then ah, now how, they have sense knowledge. Of course, I'm thinking like, how does this work though with sexual trauma? Because it's not like you, you know, you can be, you can have, you can experience sexual trauma and still experience healing without having sex, right, like right. consensual sex. And there is this, you know, Unfortunately, there is, again, the kind of prevailing notion amongst, amongst progressives who are very, uh, to see sex in a certain way that I don't think is grounded in Christian anthropology, mm -hmm. but they say, well, you need to just have, con that's the argument for you go and have consensual sex, mm -hmm. have pleasurable experiences, do self-pleasure to make sex not shameful and to make sex feel good. 
people need to have be it, it, with sexual trauma. So we're talking about a particular subgroup of people. So just to be clear, if somebody has this negative experiential knowledge of their own body and of sexuality due to abuse or exposure, et cetera, that sense knowledge that my body is good, sexuality is a gift, and arousal, by the way, is not a sin. Mm -hmm. Arousal itself is just a, a reaction. It's just a pleasure reaction in the body. And this is where we can unpack the idea of what are emotions, what are feelings, how do they relate to the Christian life. But before we go into all of that, pleasure is just a reaction to to sensory and moral goods. It's not a sin. It's not. It's an emotion. It's not in the realm of sin. Sin exists in the realm of the will with intent and action. So when a child has been exposed or been harmed in a way that makes them perceive that arousal itself is the problem, that needs to be corrected at a cognitive level so we kind of provide new education. But there does need to be a sensory experiential knowledge that it's not sinful to feel aroused. And even a friend of mine, Dr. Libby Reichardt, who's the Dean of Academics at St. John's Seminary, she told me she tells the priests in her seminary, uh, her seminarians in her class, she's an expert on Aquinas, and she says, sexual arousal is not a sin. It's just a reaction. So then, yeah, okay, so what do we do? Do we do the Freudian thing and say, just go have sex with as many people as possible to get rid of your shame? No, but this is where healing from sexual abuse, we also need to be as Christians very patient with people knowing that as they unearth and begin to feel arousal, sometimes it's it's a confusing, messy process for people. And can we, I would dare us to try to be pastoral and accompanying people with sensitivity that they might not yet be free for morality to the degree we wish they were yet, and we should not give up on them or shame them for not being where we wish they were at that time. And I'll say one last thing uh, regarding that for children, some of it has to do with correcting, you know, let's say they're 12 years old and they had this experience and they come to you and they're, they're getting psychological help. No, you don't need to go tell them to do sexual things, to overcome shame. But there does need to be an awareness that children integrate their sexual feelings gradually at, in adolescence. So you should not expect your 14-year-old child to be as capable of chastity and sexual integration as an adult. Mm. Not saying you endorse bad behavior, and there is especially levels of harm. When a child is acting out with another child, that's a level of harm that is intolerable. We we need to intervene at all, at all costs, basically, without harming our own child. But if, if a child was harmed and they're, let's say, 20 years old now, and they're struggling with compulsive masturbation because they were indoctrinated into this negative cycle, we should not expect them to be perfectly able to be mm -hmm. as chaste as somebody who did not have that experience. And the catechism says this as much. Mm -hmm. The catechism says psychological issues, force of habit, psychosexual maturity, and a variety of other factors can contribute, especially with regard to masturbation, in a way that reduces culpability even to a minimum. And that is not saying, it says the church has always taught in constant constant uh, tradition that it is a gravely disordered action and that it should, you know, it's it's in material sin. Yeah, yeah, masturbation. So it's not at all saying the church is wrong, but the church also says when there are these factors that have influenced a person's state in life, like mm -hmm. abuse and trauma, it's the highest good is not just immediately getting them to stop compulsive behaviors. We have to have a mm -hmm. bigger bigger picture. The highest good is helping them integrate and heal so they can be free for morality and free for the good without fear that their struggle is, you know, let's say making them, I don't know how to put it, Lila, other than to say we have to be patient with people mm. who have been through bad stuff. We have to be patient. It's a, I mean, I think that's a, a good go-to for any of this stuff because it's just messy and the human experience is so varied on it. You know, there's so many directions we can go with this, but one direction that I think is important to explore is this, the experience that a lot of people have, and especially people who maybe are in the Christian world or the con more conservative world mm -hmm. and were raised in those homes. And so they were raised by parents who really believed that sex was for marriage and they were opposed to obviously same sex behaviors, activities. They were opposed to these identities of like bisexual or gay or all of this stuff. And so the parents were, uh, or the teachers or the people in the, in the system that they grew up in, the systems they grew up in, there was a sense that some of these people feel of shame mm -hmm. about sexual behavior or activities. And so 
they reject those fundamentalist upbringings. They seem as fundamentalist and they're moving on to feel more free and sexually liberated by just living the way that they feel yeah. drawn. You mm -hmm. see what I'm talking about? Yep. So, and I think there's something real there that there is real, there is harm that is done by yep. some families, whether it's intentional or not, probably unintentional, where sex is seen as so taboo. Yes. And there's not this more... I think open view of yes, life is messy. Like the truth is the truth. God's plan for sex is still God's plan, but in the messy experience of human life and and traumas and hurts that people may have, stuff happens and how to navigate that stuff yep. in the messiness of life can make or break a person's self perceptive perception to some degree as a kid. Yeah. I, I, that's kind yes, of long winded, no, but I no, think you I'm, know where I'm, I'm going with that. So Yeah, I am. And yeah. I I'm one of the things that come to my mind when you say that is the idea of the law of gradualness, not gradualness of law. And to explain a bit further, what I mean is we are allowed to learn. God gives us permission to learn through trial and error and trial and success. That's how children learn. We're not expected to be perfect in this life, mm -hmm. much less in childhood. And gradualness of law would imply like the latter of what you mentioned about just saying none of it really matters, sort of resigning yourself to mediocrity. Mm -hmm. It's not really important. And the paradox in the spiritual life and for families to consider for their children is we have to accept exactly where we are at whatever stage we are in every way. That's essential to spiritual inner interior freedom. And Father Jacques Philippe talks about that. But then he also says, that's not to say that you don't also then foster and accept the deepest desire for the highest happiness of your life, which is God. And so we ascend to that. We we long for greatness in our lives. We, lo we long for greatness. I do. I long for it. But God gave us that longing. And so that will give us the energy to ascend to the heights of holiness while also paradoxically saying, okay, but here I am in my poverty mm. right now, right here. And I am mm. not as capable as I would like to be, but that's a, towards freedom for morality in this area of my life, psychosexual freedom or development. And I wish I was further. And God, let you know what I love? I love the work of, I can't say his name properly. It's the papal theologian right now. His name is Father Weirdczek Gajczek. <laughs> it's Polish. Mm. And he says, Part of the problem with people who have obsessive compulsive uh, sexual issues and neuroses mm. is that they take themselves so seriously that they forget that life is full of mistakes and blunders that we all make. And they're not all tragic, though. We have to be able to ask Jesus, Lord, help me to... <laughs> True holiness, he said, basically, is our poverty coming in contact with God's grace, mm. not in perfect behavior all the time. And that in our poverty, we can also learn to laugh at ourselves and not take ourselves so seriously. Of course, I made that mistake again. God, I'm little. Help me to love my littleness before you. Again, not gradualness of law, which say it doesn't matter or who cares, because we want to acknowledge that the law is true. The church's teachings are true and are for our good. But can we accept that as an example, you know, sort of narratively, I work with people who are abused as children many times. And one comes to mind where this, you know, and of course I should reiterate, I will change some details and, and be very vague on purpose to protect client mm. identity. You should know if you're going to a therapist, they will not share your mm. information in a way that would make them identifiable in any public capacity. But as an example of this, I have a client, let's say, who was a young man who was abused at around age 10 years old by an older brother and was sexually abused by an older brother. Okay, so then... By the and, way, in this case, sorry to interrupt, but was the older brother himself sexually abused? Like, why was the older brother abusing the younger brother? I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We know that this happened, mm -hmm. right? And when this client came to me for therapy, the client began both to address that issue for the first time in their life, but also concurrently was struggling with behaviors that reenacted that abuse while seeking healing from that abuse. And so mm -hmm. it's a messy mm -hmm. sort of mixture of things happening in that person's heart and mind. They love God. They want to follow God. They don't mm -hmm. understand why their feelings are so difficult to manage. And so we do the both and of accepting them where they are right now. Maybe they're still engaging in trauma reenactment. Okay, we don't send them away till they're perfect. Yeah, figure that out and then come to therapy. Mm -hmm. No, 
Come now, come before God now, come before your family and friends and loved ones now, and let us accompany you to show you the, that you are not defined by what happened to you, and you're capable of being <clears throat> experiencing God's healing love so that you can be free for the good, mm -hmm. free for morality in your life. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement one cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called Seven Weeks Coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top one to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. I love this idea of starting with, with anything in any kind of healing journey, but starting with, I am loved unconditionally as I am with all of whatever baggage or struggles or challenges. And I am loved as I am with my attractions, with my wounds, with whatever it is, like that radical affirmation and acceptance of self before God. Mm -hmm. And it, it's it, any part of progress in the spiritual journey, I think has to start with that. Mm -hmm. Well, at the same time, like you're saying, acknowledging that we are a mess, like we need God, mm -hmm. all of us for different things, but we all share the need, the desperate need because of our own wounds and our own mortality and our own sin. Like we all need God equally. And so that there's such freedom, so much opportunity there to work from mm -hmm. when you start with that, that space. And I'm, I'm thinking about someone that I know again, anonymizing this, but you know, this person who felt that they were accepted by the LGBTQ world mm -hmm. because they were finally accepted for who they were. And they felt that God liked that for them. Like God honored that for them because they finally felt full acceptance. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And that just broke my heart that they didn't feel that with others that around them, including maybe myself, because they mm. felt this weight of judgment when it comes to this is an ordered sexual path and this is a disordered sexual path. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is like, how do we thread that needle yes. for people, whether it's in therapy or friends or family that we have to say, listen, you are loved and I love you as you are. Mm. No yeah. strings attached. Mm -hmm. You are good. And God has a beautiful plan for you. You were made for greatness. Well, at the same time saying these behaviors, you know, these activities are not your identity, first of all, like disordered sexual activities. And you are still at your core loved as you are, mm -hmm. even if you're engaging in these activities. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's, yes. some people just, I guess some people are like, okay, you're basically just saying you reject me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, when we're, so one of the reasons I love that you brought this up is because I have often told my friends, people in the church, especially mm -hmm. who consider themselves traditional and sort of assent to the orthodox mm -hmm. teachings of the Christian faith, they love somebody that experiences SSA or, or things like that as long as they're perfect. Mm -hmm. It's it's like, as long as you're not a messy person with that mm -hmm. issue. And I think that is a real need in, in the Christian community to take a hard look at ourselves and say, are we willing to love not just when the people are like, yeah, I'm 100% on board with the church's teachings, though, and look how well I live them out. Mm -hmm. What about when they're not there? Mm -hmm. What about when they're not there? What if they don't get there? And this is where we also can, let's define affirmation. I You mentioned like telling them, I love you, even though these things you do aren't good. I'd say, I dare people, you don't need to say that. The truth can defend itself. I mean, if you're, if someone seeks advice from you, of mm -hmm. course, speak truth. And, uh, you know, instructing the ignorant is a spiritual work of mercy. But when and how you do that is exceptionally important to consider. We'll trust the Holy Spirit, first and foremost. But we actually demonstrate affirming unconditional love far more mm -hmm. by our expression, our um, w our words are secondary. Mm -hmm. Here's what I would offer to consider. Affirming, living affirmingly towards somebody in a way that they will feel accepted if they're capable. We can't force somebody to, to feel mm -hmm. accepted from us. So we can offer affirming love to somebody and they can reject it. Mm -hmm. 
So that's another thing to keep in mind. This requires receptivity on the part of the person we love or are trying to love. But assuming all things equal that they're receptive, our first step, our first move as Christians is a disposition of heart and mind of openness. Am I open to the goodness of the other person in front of me? And if I'm accepting and open unhurriedly to the goodness of the person in front of me, it will arouse in me delight towards their goodness. And I reveal that primarily, think about how we reveal to children, to infants. It's not just through words, it's through a tender glance, a tender touch, an expression, a tone of voice. An interestedness. An like interestedness. You're so interested in them. Yes. Yeah, you can point. say words of affirmation and lie. <laughs> So that's why words are secondary expression that can come out of an authentic mm -hmm. affirm, affirming presence, but being truly Christian and unconditionally affirming in an authentic way starts with an openness and a disposition of receptivity to the goodness of the other as they are right now, not as I wish they were two years from now or two, two years ago. Such a good point, Michael. That's a really good point. That's a that's something to meditate on. You mentioned you said the word unhurriedly. Yeah, unhurriedly. Yes. Which that's a good thing to meditate on. Yes. What? Being, what? Do you, yeah. Tell me more about that. Well, to live an affirming life towards oneself first is about being open and unhurried in my disposition of heart and mind before God, before myself, and before others. And as a fellow sinner here, that's the journey of a lifetime for me to learn. But busy hurriedness is not a default way of, and, and by the way, hurriedness, I don't just mean in like how fast you walk through life. If I'm sitting across from you and you're someone with sexual trauma and same-sex attraction and a, the host of messiness that has emerged in your life as a result of that, if I'm hurried, it's also expecting you to be where you're not. Mm. So it's about my expectations for you not just how sort of calm I sit before you. And then that person's like living in the feeling of being constantly a source of disappointment. Yes. And that's probably excruciating. Oh my. It, th and they don't want to be yes. around those tables anymore because they're always the disappointment. And so, and they're also like uh, rebelling against it. Like, how dare you see me as a disappointment anyways, right? It might yep. be the natural human response. And so they don't show up at the table anymore. Yeah. And... How can we be affirming towards people we don't have a relationship with? Yeah. It's not possible. And I have a lot of mm -hmm. families I work with with parents over the years who have children, adult children who don't, who reject the church or take on a gay identity. But I know this is beyond just the same sex attraction issue in this conversation. It could also be imagine if you have a child who's living with their, mm -hmm. their boyfriend or girlfriend. If you assume that acceptance of your child as they are right now, in every way, whatever, is equivalent to approving, you will be afraid to accept them. But the church distinguishes between acceptance and approval. So this, of course, brings up you know a lot of practical questions for people, because first of all, there's the question of commonality, right? If someone is really, uh, let's say they're not already in the fold trying to do you know, live their mm -hmm. Christian faith, or they, they may live, be living a form of Christian faith in their view, but they're not in any way in agreement about sexual morality. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, and they're living their, whatever <laughs> lifestyle in, they're living it hardcore and it's not a Christian lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not like they're trying to get out of this thing. They're right. like in it. And there's a lack of commonality now, especially like in a family culture where there's, there's, it's a Christian family with that person. They're not living mm -hmm. their, their world is a different world, right? Or old friends they may have, their world is a different world. How do you reach out to a person like that? If there is goodwill, that's important to distinguish, you know, does this person <clears throat> sense that I have goodwill and do they have goodwill toward me? I think it's the easy, obvious things like, do you want to get coffee? I mean, mm -hmm. it's really simple. I think I mentioned this last time too. Fear is a really unhelpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a all emotions are good. We could talk about more emotion emotions more another time. Do too much emotions yeah. today. We'll but, do emotions okay, in the yeah. future, Michael. But <laughs> in this context, it's good to remember all emotions are good because they are just faculties given by God to help us right. choose the good and avoid evil. But it is by their nature to be guided by reason. Mm. But fear is mostly useless. Mm. And so it's good you that we have so? it. It's good that we have it. 
and it's good in certain circumstances, but most of the time it's useless. Do you think fear, well, this is a question and we we will do another episode on emotions. I know that's on the docket, but uh, when it comes to sexual, potential sexual trauma, like there's the whole thing of like, it's good to be afraid when you're walking down a dark alley and not choose to go down the rest of the alley because you might get mugged, right? Right. So in that sense, your trigger response to like these perceived uh, potential dangers is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to uh, disordered sexual behavior activities, you know, God forbid, abuse, sexual Mm -hmm. abuse, things like this, there's good, it's good to have a healthy fear now. Yes. So fear, that's why it's- Is there a healthy fear of that? Yeah. And that's why fear is inherently a gift. But it's also why Jesus speaks a lot about not worrying about the future, because uh, attaching ourselves and being in a fearful state of heart and mind is not helpful for uh, integrated living. Because ultimately, we, if we trust that God loves us and our loved ones infinitely more and infinitely better than we do, we will not live out of a spirit of fear, but out of a spirit of trust and out of love. And so in survival situations where there is particular threats, your body will know how to respond, hopefully, you know, and all things being equal. So I'm not saying not to take in consideration natural fear as a response to perceived threats, but sometimes our threat perception is broadly and widely, it's like a net we've cast way too broad and way too wide because we don't trust. And so in this context, with this conversation, Am I so afraid that my child will interpret my acceptance in a negative way that I just withhold Mm. accepting them? That's being driven by fear, as opposed to being out of love, open to the goodness of my child, whatever and wherever they are, and allowing that to move me towards fostering ongoing relationship. And during that relationship, there's healing that can occur. And the church says acceptance and approval are different. We must accept with compassion, sensitivity, and respect all people who have same-sex attraction, whether or not they identify with the church's teachings or not on this. But all, and all signs of unjust discrimination must be avoided. I'm quoting the catechism. But homosexual acts must never be approved under any circumstances. Well, let's apply that to how we treat people who live with their spouse, who practice, comp- or live, excuse me, live with their boyfriend or girlfriend, or practice contraception, or do these things that we know in the sexual realm of our ethics and morals aren't oriented or highest toward their highest good. Well, we should still accept them where they are, but that's not, it's, it cannot be intrinsically approval because the church is distinguished between the two. So I just think parents need to not be as afraid that showing acceptance will be interpreted Mm. as approval, because I've seen more in my experience with clients, when a parent operates out of that fear, they're more likely to shun their child and not have them at the table, like you said. And when you're not sharing a meal at the table together of life, how can you even have influence and how can you have healthy influence towards the good? So do you invite the same-sex partner to the to the meal. See what I'm I'm asking? Like, what does that practically look like in a family dynamic? Well, I think is more important than answering you directly Mm -hmm. is to say, have you prayed and asked for the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. to guide you towards what is right in that particular circumstance with those principles Mm -hmm. in mind? Because that's where prudence comes into play, to see, to judge, and to act. So if we ask God for the grace and we turn towards him and ask for the grace to have good uh, and, and act prudence, the virtue of prudence, we will come to better answers than if we just on our own are like, well, I'm not going to do that because that's scary. So not a, not you're saying it's it, we're wary of a clear prescription on that. It really, I am, a lot yeah. of it has to do with prudence. What about like a same sex wedding though? Something, uh, something like that. Yeah. I think we're going sort of deeper into yeah. that, that deeply personal act mm-hmm. of prudence that you have to trust God, mm-hmm. trust your relationship with that person. I personally also think children should be considered. Mm-hmm. So instead of answering that question, I'll pose another question. What about whenever you're a a family who one sibling identifies as trans or identifies as gay and has a same-sex partner, and then you have children Mm -hmm. and you're concerned, you know, bringing them around the family might convey a message that's confusing to your children. These are real questions that people are wrestling with. And I don't have a clear prescription, Mm -hmm. but I will say you'll come to a better answer if you reflect on the church's teachings, Mm -hmm. that that person must be accepted with compassion, sensitivity, and respect. And that God 
is for you. I said this at the beginning. God is more for you than you are for yourself. He is our advocate before God's self. He will give you wisdom and guidance if we seek it. And he is more for your family member than you are for them. Mm -hmm. He wants their eternal salvation infinitely more than you want it for them. And if we can trust that, I just, I'm convinced we'll come to better choices when we when we reflect on those principles. But I think if you have young children and you're trying to protect their innocence, then there, you can make the argument that depending on a lifestyle that someone may choose to be living, right? And it doesn't have to be even involving like homosexuality or something. It could be any number of other things. Mm -hmm. You might want to be more careful with the exposure, how yeah. your kids engage with that person, yep. not because that person's bad, not because you don't accept and love that person, but because you're trying to navigate protecting yep. your child. And right. these are, of course, all you know the, the realm of prudence. So I know there's not like one clear prescription necessarily, but I think if it comes from that basis that you're saying of love always love for your child, for the person, for this, for that. Like it has to come from that place of love and knowing that God loves this person more than you ever will. Right. And love means to will the good of the other at the highest mm -hmm. agape form of love and to will the good of my children would be to protect them from anything harmful. Yeah. So that's a very reasonable framework to reflect mm -hmm. on in the context of being prudential, having prudential judgment. And this thing is how do I protect my children mm -hmm. from harm? Um, so of course I would respect parents' rights to limit exposure to certain things. I'm just saying, if you come from a place of differentiating between acceptance and approval, mm -hmm. that accepting people as they are is not tacit endorsement for everything they do. And if you can be, let that go a little bit, have a little bit more freedom, just say like, it's not my job to deny every perspective they present with mm -hmm. me. The truth will defend itself. Mm -hmm. I don't have to constantly be vigilant and make sure I say the right thing at the right moment all the time. Can I just be open to their goodness? And there are people in my life, some of my clients, Lila, that identify as gay. They do not agree with the church's teachings. And their parents, as adults, they said, oh, well, you can go see this therapist. He's Catholic. We trust him. And it is very humbling to me just to be open to their goodness, even though they don't necessarily They're buy what there. I have to sell, yeah. like they don't want it, but then they might have a corrective emotional experience that, well, this, I'm not trying to brag or make it about me, but like if I can hold space, as they say in the psychology <laughs> world, for this person's reality and empathize and be with them, they might have a corrective emotional experience about what a Catholic and what a Christian can be for mm -hmm. them. Beautiful. All right. Any other final thoughts right now on sexual abuse and healing? Well, boy, there's a lot. So a couple come to mind right off the bat. You said earlier, what can they do? And we talked about seeking therapy and seeking help. Spiritual healing is so important. Even in my own life, I started realizing the need for specifically prayer healing ministry, the sacraments being integral to my healing journey from wounds that are similar to the things we've talked about today in my life. So not minimizing spiritual healing. I know I said that last time, but it's so important because the psychological domain, the current therapy milieu is very, in my opinion, dismissive of the body-soul mm -hmm. reality. And so those people who have been through things like this need, need to know that often the enemy attaches himself to our wounds in a way that keeps us stuck in them. And the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to have freedom from those attachments, however that looks. So to not minimize the need for spiritual healing and seeking that psychological support. And then the word of hope to end, oh, we have to end with hope always, <laughs> that I have experienced healing in my own life. Am I perfect? No. Do I still have room to grow? Of course, but I've experienced it. The Lord has healed my heart. Mary has touched my heart. Mm -hmm. Friends and family have touched my heart. I need more healing, but I'm on my journey and that I've witnessed other people on their journey and you can be on your journey of healing too. God calls us out of our wounds into mm -hmm. adopted sonhood or daughterhood or childhood, whatever the words would be for that. And that calling into our adoption as children of God, it just has to anchor this conversation um, because healing is real and is possible. Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thanks You're welcome. for making your life about that. Mm. It's awesome. It's I beautiful. Receive it. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. As always, don't forget to be subscribed if you're not already subscribed. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. 
A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.